Tony, that's fine, but I do want to tr figure out how to share my slides. So, okay, I pressed on the arrow. Keep it in presentation mode. Uh -huh. PowerPoint. But, yeah. And hold shift to select mode. Oh, okay, share. Got it. Yep. Am I sharing? Yes. But you're, but you're sharing. Okay. You're sharing presenter mode rather than presentation mode. So, so just go to the bottom of your screen, Ola. Your PowerPoint screen. Yes, my PowerPoint. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know how to switch to I know how to switch to presentation. Okay. Mode. I thought that was the problem. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I will go ahead and share this slide for now. So Gandhi is using a cool icon. Do I have time to find a cool icon? Probably, right? I'm just in case I'm emailing my presentation to all of you because if technology fails me, I'm going to ask for somebody to be my hands. It says it translated Gandhi as God. <laughs> I assume not even her students refer to her quite that way. All right. Um, Kira, feel free to go ahead and begin. All right, welcome everyone. Before we hear from the panelists, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. We have everyone muted to cut down on background noise. If you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please use the chat box and send it to everyone so the person monitoring chat doesn't miss it. We're running on a tight schedule, so we'll end on time so everyone can get to the next session. This session is being recorded. The session is eligible for Certified Health Education Specialist Credit and CE Credit from the Medical Library Association. We'll be sending out an evaluation at the end of the day. Completing the evaluation is the first step in claiming your CE. I will now turn it over to Ala, Ala Kesselman. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. It's an honor to be here. And the focus of this panel is fighting health news with e-health literacy. We have four panelists and a Q&A and discussion after that. Our first presenter is Dr. Catherine Arnold smith She is a professor of information science at the University of Wisconsin-Medicine. And she will talk about measuring misinformation online. The next presenter is Dr. David Kaufman. Uh, he's an associate professor in medical informatics at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University. He will talk about e-health literacy. I will do the third presentation. My name is Ala Kesselman. I'm a senior social science analyst at the National Library of Medicine. And I will present an empirical study done by this team on how e-health literacy provides protection against susceptibility to misinformation. And last but not least, Dr. Gandhi Leroy, a professor of management information systems at the University of Arizona. Uh, she will talk about machine methods for detecting misinformation. And without further ado, I am passing the virtual microphone to Dr. Catherine Arnold Smith. Okay, here it comes. All right. So welcome to my little talk about measuring mis misinformation online. So this audience is probably really familiar with the attributes of high quality information. Two widely used long running assessment tools for web content are DISCERN, which actually started for evaluation of patient information pamphlets and then migrated online and the ONCODE for Health on the Net Code, which was developed to focus on web content originally. I put the sites that describe these tools on this slide. These two tools do different things, but they agree on some major criteria to check for quality among others. There's the authors, who's responsible for the information. There's the purpose, why did the information get produced in the first place? There's the recency, how current is the information? And finally, there's the citations. Are there sources provided for the information? So it's difficult sometimes to make ourselves think about the reverse of all this, poor information, and what might be markers for it, as opposed to just the opposite of high quality information. 
some Canadian researchers used evidence-based principles to develop a taxonomy of internet health scams. And what these researchers were interested in was outright fraud that ensnared people for health-related reasons. So health scams aren't synonymous with misinformation, but health scams certainly rely on misinformation to work. And these researchers noted that because a lot of frauds aren't reported in the first place, there isn't a lot of case law about them, which means there isn't a lot of data to analyze to come up with such a taxonomy. The taxonomy and the tool they developed, this was Garrett et al. in 2019, and I put the citation on my work cited handout. This tool can be used to assess both products and services in healthcare, and it identifies these attributes to evaluate, each of which serves as a marker of low or at least questionable quality. So one of them is authority, as in you're using celebrity status to promote a product. Scarcity, you've identified your product or service as rare or exclusive. Liking and similarity means the use of social influence to establish the product or service as popular. Reciprocation means it comes with a free gift. Effects claims, you're citing satisfied patients or describing extraordinary miraculous effects. Pseudo-technical language, pseudoscience, and finally, evidence comes up for low quality too, because you have to think of what level of evidence or evidence at all was provided to support the claims that are made about the product or the service. Now, a systematic review done in 2019 by Wang et al. focused on 131 research studies about misinformation in health and found the largest category was studies about communicable diseases which included 16 specific to viruses and influenza and 14 specific to vaccination. After that came cancer, cardiovascular disease, psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease. There were also some misinformation studies that focused on personal health behaviors like diet or smoking or not. And two of them focused on water safety or quality. So some YouTube examples pre-COVID, there's a small cottage industry now of health sciences studies of YouTube videos. The indexing on this topic in PubMed is a bit inconsistent, so it's hard to wrangle. But as of late March 2021 in PubMed, 85 of these studies had been indexed as relevant to patient education, so I focused on those. They were done in numerous different healthcare specialties with a very long tail on the graph. The most studies in a single domain were about surgery information, that was 17%. After that, there were multiple studies in other domains from pediatrics down through oncology, et cetera. 53 of those studies, or 62%, were focused on the quality of content in YouTube. So I asked, what did misinformation turn out to mean in those 53 YouTube studies? Just what were the researchers looking for? How did they operationalize misinformation? Well, to repeat the old line about having a hammer so everything looks like a nail, the answer to the question, what were they looking for, has, of course, a lot to do with the instruments the researchers used to do their assessments of the quality of the content. So what I'm interested in for today's talk is just how those studies approach the concept of misinformation, because it's a fact that neither discern nor the ONCODE, which are the two instruments used the most often in health sciences literature for studies like this, neither of them attempts to go near the question of accuracy. The discern instrument, for example, has this fine print. Discern cannot be used to assess the scientific quality or the accuracy of the evidence on which a publication is based, as this would require checking against other sources. The lack of attention to accuracy becomes a problem when you're attempting to measure either misinformation or disinformation in an evidence-based way, because without considering accuracy of content, we can't say much about inaccuracy. So I was curious about what these 53 studies of YouTube content quality considered to be bad information. Here's a list of the factors that the researchers on those 53 studies assessed when they looked at YouTube content, which they themselves said was problematic. Problem information mostly 
gets called low quality. That's the criterion that turns up the most all the way down through inadequate. The term that gets the closest, I think, to the concept of misinformation is inaccurate, but only 9% of the studies chose to assess YouTube content on that basis. And the other contender, lack of evidence, gets assessed in only 2% of the studies. It's interesting to me that all the other concepts on this slide are multifaceted concepts that may incorporate the idea that something is inaccurate. But because the instruments used to rate the content of these YouTube videos don't measure inaccuracy, they don't get at the central issue that information may simply be wrong. You know, fake news. So here's some examples of recent YouTube studies that did examine accuracy of YouTube video content. Gout, 114 YouTube videos analyzed in 2021 by Ander and Zengen. Most of them found to be pretty good. 12% had misleading information. Of those, the bulk of it came from independent user creators as opposed to stuff created by physicians or practices or agencies in healthcare. Loeb et al. in 2019 looked at prostate cancer, 30% characterized as having high misinformation. They also, there's of this one called out the infamous comment section on YouTube. And they wrote, we noted significant persuasion of users in those comments to pursue guideline discordant treatment, which is a nice way of referring to inaccuracy, or unproven natural remedies by videos and or social interactions with other users. And La Cruz Perez et al. looked at autism spectrum disorder and found 9% of their sample of 150 videos were harmful or dangerous with these examples. Videos that propose interventions that pose risks, videos that encourage families to abandon any other type of intervention, and those which can be described as miraculous. Those are examples that really bring home the cost of misinformation, but it seems to be difficult for researchers and the developers of evaluation instruments to operationalize accuracy of information. And this means that the burden of untangling misinformation from the good stuff inevitably falls on the users, the viewer in the case of YouTube videos themselves. My colleague, Ella Kesselman, is now going to talk about our recent study in which a YouTube video played a central role. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Catherine. I will, but not yet. Next is oh, okay. Dave Kaufman, who will talk about e-health literacy. You're on mute. Um, you know, that has to be the phrase of the year. You are mute. You're on mute. Um, so I'm going to talk about e-health literacy in an ever-changing digital world. And this digital world, of course, is fraught with uh, fake health news and misinformation, as Catherine talked about, and as um, Dr. Kesselman will also talk about, as well as Dr. Uh, Leroy Gandhi. Dr. Gandhi Leroy, sorry about that. So health literacy is a widely understood construct. It's been around probably for more than 25 years. Uh, I would say at least 25 years. Um, it's something of growing importance. Uh, it reflects and measures a patient's ability to read, comprehend, and act on medical instructions, including difficulty processing oral com communications, for example, with a provider, conceptualizing risk. We'll talk a little bit more about risk. And it reflects a range of knowledge and competencies, including cultural, uh, an important dimension, and conceptual knowledge, listening, speaking, quantitative writing, reading skills, basically affects the gamut, every interaction you have with the healthcare system, health literacy comes into play. And it's not a static concept, it continues to evolve. And Dave, so I'm, I'm, talk very, I'm very sorry to interrupt. Are you, you're not sharing the slides. I don't know if you intend to. I'm not sharing the slides. Okay, my apologies. And now you are. Okay, so, um, so I went through, I talked about uh, health literacy. Um, so 
as we talked about, it's a measure of patient's ability to read, comprehend, and act on, and so forth. It reflects a range of knowledge and competencies where some of these are well understood, the cultural dimension, which is really important in an age of misinformation and fake health news. That's something we need to better understand. It engages all interactions with the system, with the healthcare system, and there's um, a numerous studies that demonstrate that low literacy is associated with poor health care outcomes, for example, in relation to diabetes patients and in HIV management. Um, another dimension of literacy, uh, which is a really cut cross cutting. Um, so numeracy has been an issue, a long standing issue. It refers to the degree to which individuals have the capacity to access, process, interpret, communicate and act on numerical, quantitative, graphical, biostatistical, and probabilistic information needed to make effective health decisions. Uh, numeracy has long been a significant problem uh, in terms of health literacy and in the healthcare system. Uh, it's been magnified in the digital age, and this is really cross-cutting. So some of these other literacies are really associated, are correlated with educational level, but numeracy is a cross-cutting problem. Uh, for example, one particular problem is associated with risk. For example, if you're explaining to a cancer patient the different options they may have and providing a prognosis and doing a set of risk calculations of option A versus option B, those are notoriously difficult for a patient to process and understand. So as we enter the digital health arena, we could talk about a range of tools. And this again is not a static category, uh, but it's an ever changing one. And so e-health tools include web portals uh, where you can get usually reasonably high quality information. Uh, Consumer Reports e Health is, an, is one, uh, Medline Plus, personal health records typically associated with electronic health records. Uh, in, in most cases, in any case, and patients are increasingly encouraged to engage them. Um, online forum, online communities, which dis include discussion forums and special dedicated site like patients like me. We could also include social media under uh, on, online communities, though it takes a different form and it presents unique challenges. Um, we could also think about it in a different way about task categories, decision-making, for example, helping patients with certain treatment decisions, um, selecting hospitals, selecting a surgeon uh, and so forth, uh, different reasons for information seeking, for oneself, for a spouse, for a loved one, et cetera, uh, might be in terms of seeking particular advice on a new therapy or learning about he healthy behaviors and lifestyle. Um, there's also the communication space, uh, which includes blogging, includes nurse video visits. Uh, so these all present new literacy challenges. And I am just moving the, okay. Um, so in the digital health solution space, uh, we're offering ever expanding options. And one of our goals is to make sure that we don't, that we serve to reduce health disparities, not to increase them. And health literacy is kind of, is a wedge issue. So um, of course it's associated with people of lower education, typically lower SES status. And as we enhance the number of options, we wanna make sure that we are inclusive and we find ways to bridge the digital divide, not increase that divide. Which brings us to um, an overall construct that has really emerged in the past 10 or 15 years, uh, referred to as e-health literacy. It's a set of knowledge and skills to fully engage in and benefit from the e-health tools that we just talked about. Um, our goals as researchers, but also uh, practitioners is to understand the gaps and barriers uh, between a consumer or a patient uh, and an e-health tool. We're all, we're all consumers, of course. A critical question is, can patients, consumers use a system or tool proficiently and autonom autonomously? That takes on a new meaning in the context of uh, fake health news and health misinformation. So one of our goals in understanding e-health literacy is to leverage this knowledge and to minimize the digital divide. Now I'm gonna to talk to you 
Oh, I didn't mention. So literacy also involves a mastery of cultural practices and there are multiple literacies uh, in e-health. And this is a continually evolving area. Um, and, you know, COVID shone light on a lot of the immense challenges, um, but it also creates a set of opportunities for us. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about, so this is a model developed by Norman and Skinner uh, around 2008. Uh, it's a pretty simple model. It's associated with a screening tool, uh, but it, it provides a lot of insight. So I've talked about numeracy, I've talked about health literacy. And so information literacy, uh, some, an area where um, uh, doc, Dr. Catherine Arnott Smith is, is an expert refers to the skills to articulate information needs, locate, evaluate, and use information, and apply it to create and communicate knowledge. Uh, media literacy is basically attending to a variety of visual or audio, for, audio forms, such as YouTube, for example, um, ability to select, uh, interpret, evaluate, and create meaning from resources presented uh, in these forms. Uh, computer literacy, uh, is an increasing range of skills used to uh, used to solve used to use computers to solve problems. Um, science literacy is basically familiarity with basic biological concepts um, and familiarity with the scientific method. And this and Dr. Kesselman will be talking about that. Um, it also reflects the ability to understand, evaluate, and interpret health research findings using appropriate scientific reasoning. And we know that generally consumers and lay people are deficient to that in important respect. Science literacy, all these other literacies to varying extents have been well studied. Science literally, literacy in the context of healthcare has not been. Dr. Kesselman and Dr. Smith have a history of studying that and the study that Dr. Kesselman will present today, she will talk about certain aspects of health literacy. Um, so I won't talk too much about this screening tool but it's, it's developed by Norman and Skinner in 2006. It's a very simple eight item self-report screening tool. It's widely used. You know, there's a lot more complexity to e-health literacy, um, but, this is, um, but th this is a very useful tool um, for basic screening, basic understanding, setting a set of expectations of whether a particular um, intervention will work with patients. Now, we're working in a novel area where misinformation continues to proliferate. And the goal is basically to understand e-health literacy as patients are confronted with this new information, new set of challenges across media. There are other layers of complexity that go well beyond e-health literacy. And Dr. Kessman will talk about that. And I think I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, I've got to stop sharing. This is what I was afraid of a little bit for some reason, my, my PowerPoint froze. Um, can, I, can I ask somebody else to share my slides? Gandhi, would you, would you mind sharing my slides? I'm sorry about that. Um, did you send them? Yes. And in the meantime, I will start talking. So, um, I'm going to present an empirical research study that the people on this panel conducted together. Um, and it's a study that connects the public susceptibility to health misinformation that Dr. Smith, that Catherine was talking about, and certain components of e-health literacy from, uh, from the collection that Dr. Kaufman talked about. 
whether they uh, and our research questions had to do with whether those literacies can provide barriers or protection against misinformation. And now I'm just hoping for my slides to. I have your slides up. Do you want? Okay, me to excellent. Speak? If you have them. Oh, Gandhi started sharing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Then you're sharing yours. I probably should not be giving your presentation. <laughs> if David has them, maybe we should should we go that route? Okay, excellent. Okay, my, my apologies about this. Okay, great. So um, no more bumps from here. So uh, we had three objectives in this research study. Uh, so the first one, we wanted to gauge our participants' willingness to share a non-evidence-based YouTube video about strengthening the immune system by dietary supplements, kind of the sort of YouTube videos that Dr. Smith was talking about. Then further, we wanted to analyze what information participants viewed as supportive of the claims made by that video. And lastly, finally, we wanted to investigate how two specific components of e-health literacy, namely information literacy and science literacy, impact, impact susceptibility or provide protection um, regardless information, regarding information in the video. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to show that video, but just to give you an idea. Uh, so we recruited 150 participants around the country with the help of NLM, and they viewed a YouTube video that was an excerpt over morning TV news uh, in which anchors interviewed a wellness pharmacy representative who was promoting their product for boosting the immune system. Now, the relationship between dietary supplements uh, and nutrients and the immune system is complex. The claims made in that video were very simple and kind of characterized by misinformation characteristics that Dr. Smith highlighted in her talk. It was promoted as the best immune booster on the market. The claims were very far reaching. The supplements were supposed to cure a lot of things and the cost was high. It was approximately $40 for a 60 capsule bottle. And the recommendation was to take a lot of pills per day. Next slide, please. Okay, so the task was the following. We asked our participants to view the video and then answer the question about whether they would share it. So, and then after that, we asked them what kind of information would have increased or decreased their, their confidence in the, in the accurateness of the information in the video. So as far as willingness to share, we had 150 participants, 105, a vast majority out of 150, said that they were very likely or somewhat likely to share it. And this was given in response to a specific scenario. We said, imagine you have, you have a cousin who gets sick with flus and colds a lot. Would you share this video with your cousin? So the majority, yes. And these are the reasons. So many people are already firm believers in supplements. They are familiar with specific ingredients mentioned in these supplements, such as zinc and edelberry. Um, and there is also a belief in this wisdom of crowdsourcing. So somebody said if the quality is not good, many people would have complained. I haven't heard people complaining about this, about this product and therefore it probably works. Next slide. So in our next question, we gave a number of possibilities or situation for what information can come your way. For example, a review by scientists from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases concludes that scientific evidence supports the claim that this supplement reduces frequency and severity of respiratory infections. And we asked the question, would this um, increase, would this affect your 
uh, support of the information uh, or your view of the supplements positively, negatively, or not at all. So in the second column, you are seeing numbers of people who said that this particular bit of information would, pos would have positively affect uh, the, the participants opinion of the supplement. And our first bit of news is very good. We're showing that people in fact do have trust in science and do have trust in the NIH and 150 people uh, out, I'm sorry, and 127 people out of 150 said that if there was supporting evidence from this institute, this would have positively affected the review of supplement of the supplement. From there, however, the news gets worse because uh, the next most positively influencing information type is another friend says that she has been taking this product for the past two years and has never and has never caught a cold. So you know, one person here say. 124 out of 150 people said that this would positively affect their view of the supplement. Mm. Next, a survey of consumers of the product without a control group, um, 99 out of 150 people, again, would see it as, uh, as good quality supporting evidence. Um, people have strong beliefs in crowdsourcing. So a positive review on a crowdsourcing website would be, would, be, would be regarded very positively. And lastly, the supplement company's website states that a study on other people found product to be beneficial. And again, the majority of people would see this as supporting evidence. Next slide, please. So this is disconcerting, of course, but not surprising. Um, what we wanted to see, however, is how various literacy components may provide protection against this. So after this first task, we gave our participants um, several more survey tasks in which we measured their information literacy science literacy, knowledge about the immune system, interpersonal trust, and trust in healthcare establishment. So information literacy we define as a set of aptitudes to locate, handle, evaluate, and use information efficiently for a wide variety of purposes. And I will show sample tasks from these questionnaires. Science literacy is the ability to identify a valid scientific argument and also understanding how elements of research design, such as presence or absence of a control group, impact scientific conclusions. And then the task is about boosting the immune system. So what about the knowledge about the immune system proper? Next one, interpersonal trust, often measured in social sciences, uh, kind of general trust of humanity versus skepticism measured by the, this question. Generally speaking, would you say that most people can be trusted? And lastly, trust in healthcare establishment, NIH, CDC, FDA, mm, traditional healthcare. Okay, next slide, please. So first I wanna show our results with regard to information literacy. First, a sample question. So there were six questions. Here is, uh, here is a sample question. You wanna find more information about making your immune system stronger. You type boost immune system into Google from the results of that search, which is likely the most reliable information source. And then the participants have four multiple choice options to select from. The highlighted one is the correct answer. So overall in our sample, the average score was about 3.23 3 out of six. So that, that was the situation. Let's go to the next slide, please. The next dimension of e-health literacy we measured was science literacy. Science literacy is challenging. Um, here is a sample question. This year, there were 100,000 more cases of adolescent depression diagnosed in the US than last year. Thus, adolescent depression in the US is on the rise. Is this a good scientific argument? Uh, questions are yes or no. It is not, this is a difficult question. Um, 
this is not a good scientific argument because there is not enough information in the question. We don't know the baseline. We don't know how much the lesson depression there is a year to year. We don't know how much it fluctuates. Um, and I just want to mention that we did not, some of the questions we developed ourselves, but we did an extensive review of various existing measures and based ours on them. So again, the situation is kind of comparable to information literacy. On average, people correctly answer about half of the question. So average is 6.57 out of 12. Okay, next slide, please. So information literacy and science literacy are a challenge. Our main question was though, however, do these scores predict willingness to share the information? In other words, are people with higher information literacy level, higher science literacy level, more trust in um, in reliable health information in, in the health information in the health establishment? I'm sorry, um, with some knowledge of the immune system, are they more likely to be skeptical about the video or not? So to do this, first we looked at these factors and they correlate a lot. There is meaning people who get high scores on information literacy also get high scores on science literacy and it's a bit hard to disentangle their effects. So to deal with that, we did what's called stepwise regression model. So we entered factors one at a time and we looked at how the explanatory power of our model changes. So first, we entered the immune system now. And it was what's called statistically significant, but the effect was small. This immune system knowledge only explains 3.4% of the variance of the variation in the data. Then we added scientific reasoning. Again, it increased significantly but not very well, somewhat largely, to 7.3. Then we added trust, again, significant increase. And then we added information literacy. And with that in the model, our factors explain 24% of the, of the variance in the responses, which is, it may not seem like a lot, but for social studies, uh, data, it's actually very good because there are a lot of other factors, cultural factors, experiential factors. The most important thing I want to leave you with though, the, if we look at single predictors, in other words, models was just one predictor in the model, information literacy is the strongest single predictor. As a snapshot, um, participants whose information literacy scores was six, the highest, of them, only 22% said they would share the video. For those whose information literacy score was one, 95% said they will share the video. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. So what does this mean for us as a field, for people who are interested in health communication, education, information provision. So we know that people have the tendency to accept and share information that we as people in this field don't view as high quality. And this is, again, this is not surprising. However, I think our results have a hopeful message because there are things that we can do to help. We showed that information literacy makes a difference and information literacy, it's, information literacy is not a quick thing to change, but information literacy programs are great potential things to do. Also trust, building trust, especially trust in science uh, and trust in relationships with our organizations, connecting the public and scientists and helping the public navigate scientific sources, science literacy magic also it's the most probably difficult thing to change because scientific literacy is something that happens over many years, is developed over many years education in school, outside schools. But again, we can, we can provide some supports to that. 
that's that's it as far as my slides. Thank you very much. I apologize for the technical difficulties. And uh, I would like to pass the microphone to Dr. Gondi Leroy. Okay, thank you. Now I finally get to uh, share my slides. I selected the slideshow instead of the monitor. That's why we had the confusion. So let me see if I can fix that now. So last part, you can all see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. So last misinformation detection. And so I want to start out by explaining my little image here because uh, this is not a random image. In addition to my day job, I am involved in some diversity projects. And so we were looking for a picture of a female professor and guess what we get? All the images were along these lines. So I hope you take a look at the video and you tell me I do not look like that and we can stop this kind of misinformation. And ideally we do it by algorithm. Um, let's look first at a couple of types of misinformation. First of all, you have human generated misinformation. That's what we've been talking about quite a bit here. It's slower to create because somebody is typing and making it up, but it can still spread very fast on social networks. There are different typologies out there. This is one that I like. It actually comes from an article in a law journal. So many different disciplines looking at this. And I like it because it looks at the different types of payoffs that you can receive. But we also have a lot of machine generated misinformation, AI generated. And I put the I between parentheses here because artificial intelligence, sometimes the intelligence is pretty dumb here. So for example, you can write some programs that get triggered by certain words and then um, reply with certain comments, say on Twitter, for example. It's not that smart, but if you do it a few thousand times, a few million times, it's going to have an impact. Um, it can be more sophisticated. You can have programs that have their own accounts and that reply to other uh, posts. And these programs can also be programmed to work together and coordinate. So if you have a few thousand or a few million of programs responding to a certain tweet, that certainly is going to have an effect on what is out there. And so this can have a big influence on misinformation. So what can we do about it? Um, catching misinformation. We've seen a lot of research and a big part of it is educate people to recognize misinformation. The burden is quite often on the healthcare providers. Several organizations are starting programs or have programs to help with that. Taking it a step further, you can find the misinformation and try and connect it. So SciCheck is one of these examples of, of groups that do that. But we want to be more efficient, right? So we could create algorithms to check and find the misinformation. You can think of these algorithms as two different groups. One would be the rule-based algorithms. And this is where you or I or any expert, we define the typical pattern that is associated with misinformation. Maybe a lot of exclamation marks and a lot of emotion words. It's a simplification, but serves as an example. So you can program that and then try and catch everything that matches that pattern. What we can also do is we can let the machine find these patterns and then apply that to identify more misinformation. To do that, there are lots of algorithms available. Traditional algorithms, neural networks, decision trees, they need reasonable data sets. A few hundred examples, a few thousand examples is better, but they can be trained using that. The new generation, deep learning, they are awesome new algorithms, can do very sophisticated things. But the problem is they need a lot of examples. So now we're talking not a few thousands anymore, but hopefully a few million of examples. Examples that tell you what is misinformation, so labeled examples. In both of these categories, there are two groups. We have supervised learning and we have unsupervised learning. So on the left here, you see a picture of supervised learning. What is particular to this is that you have a training data set of which you know what is fact or fiction, misinformation or not. So you can imagine if you need a few million of these, this is not easy to do. But if you have it, you can train your machine learning model and then apply it to any new item and say fact or fiction. Unsupervised learning is becoming more and more popular because here we try to train algorithms using data that isn't labeled yet. So it's a lot less effort. 
One example here is clustering. So you can group, say, for example, your tweets, and then you look at your groups, and if you had a good clustering algorithm, you may have a group that is all fact, and you may have a group that is all fiction. So any new item that you want to judge, you say, which group would it fall into? And that's another way of labeling things using unsupervised learning. But so there are a few bottlenecks here. The first one is whatever you're going to do, you need a large training data set. Once you have it trained, you need, um, you need time. Once you have the data, I mean, you need time to train it. And once your model is trained, you need to keep it updated. So these are a couple of common bottlenecks. Because they're so important, we actually have in information and computer science, we have entire research streams that focus on getting the data ready. For example, how to squeeze out the most information from a small data set, or how good can we create data using something like Amazon Mechanical Turk, or can we use algorithms for weak supervision, which is using an algorithm to create a data set, and then other algorithms are going to use that data set to learn from. So lots of research dealing with getting the data. Other types of research we'll look at once we have something, how do we know why an algorithm assigns something as fact or fiction, right? How do we make this transparent, interpretable? So these are some of the larger research streams. So back to COVID. I wanted to point out that there is a lot of machine learning going on for other things than misinformation labeling. For example, better diagnosis using X-rays or CT scans. So a lot of research going on for that. Misinformation itself, um, in general, we've been looking at this for a long time, and you have entire conferences dedicated to that. More recently, of course, people are looking at vaccine and masks and COVID-related misinformation. And you see the first data sets are popping up. You see the first results. For example, here is a study. They use 60,000 annotated tweets. And I put it here to show you how difficult it still is, because precision and recall of applying a number of machine learning algorithms was still really below 60%. So this is not an easy task to do, especially not at the speed that we want it to happen, right? So what are we doing? First of all, um, we're trying to counter with correct information. And for example, Facebook and Twitter offer free advertising credits for people, for, for organizations that trust to put up the correct information. In a session before our panel, somebody mentioned there was some vaccine information fatigue. Uh, well, this, this might be contributing to that, right? What else can we do? Well, once the inf misinformation is out there, we should try and counter it. One way of doing it is, for example, Apple and Google, they don't let just any app on their store anymore. So they limit the number of apps, which is one way of kind of limiting the information. But there are a number of algorithmic approaches, right? Fact checking, I think we're all familiar with that. Compare the information that you extract automatically with trusted sources. Maybe you have a database or an ontology, compare it, label it. Once you have information labels like that, you can do a variety of things. You could adjust the rankings in a search engine. And Facebook was doing this as an early strategy. So if you search for something, then the ones that they thought was misinformation would be ranked at the bottom. So it would certainly not pop up as the first choice anymore. They changed that recently, February 20, uh, February of this year, they said like, we're, we're gonna have specific rules, I think like 16 rules or something. So these are these patterns, right? Of what is misinformation and we use those to remove posts. Twitter does something similar. Recently, last month, they explicitly stated what they were going to do. And so they say, first of all, we're going to use human judgment. And you can read this as we're going to create data sets to train on. And once we have those, then they said, we're going to apply a combination of human and algorithm labeling. And then the, a couple of strikes and your account is frozen. Those are the rules. So that means probably apply the machine learning algorithms. The obvious ones can be automated and then have some human review for the other ones. So most projects are a combination of this, machine and human patterns, machine learning to detect the patterns, some human intervention. And then of course, we wanna have new projects. And just one example here, Google News Initiative is uh, providing $3 million in funding for innovative projects. So 
Um, COVID is only a year old, really, but we're starting to get a lot of data and resources that we can use to automate these approaches. So if you want an overview, you can look at the RAND uh, overview here. There's some, there are a lot of general tools for misinformation. This is just one of them. And then here, we're starting to get these COVID-related data sets that researchers and others can use to train algorithms. And so a couple of the examples here, and I'm not sure Tony is going to try and copy this in the chat box, but I'm happy to share my slides if anybody wants these slides. These are a few of the works that I uh, cited, but there's a lot more out there. These are just some examples COVID related. And I'm going to leave it here. And since I'm the last one of the panel, I would like to open it up for questions. And I also have our contact information here for people to dig down if they want to. And I can stop sharing in a minute or so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now we have uh, about 10 minutes for the discussion. I initially suggested that people can raise their hands, but when I'm looking at the screen, I'm not sure if that's possible. So Kiara can correct me, but um, we can start by putting things into the chat box. And I see one, I see a question from, Karin, who oversees the overall need for counter misinformation? And how are the social media outlets approached and brought on board? Who would like to take that one? Well, I can say a little bit about some of it. Um, so these are businesses and they want to do business. So public opinion is important to them. So that also drives like why they would uh, try and capture it. Uh, and that's also why you see some changes over time in what they are willing to do. There are also laws and then you have the whole uh, um, discussion about free speech. So I think we should keep in mind that these are still businesses who want to make money and that drives some of the actions they want to take. Uh, I could add just a little bit, not in terms of the regulatory uh, measures or legislation, um, but there was a tremendous amount of misinformation early on in COVID-19. Of course, some of that continued, um, but the social media sites did make a concerted effort. It was uneven, but for example, YouTube got rid of hundreds, if not probably thousands of videos about COVID misinformation. So it's kind of a, both a back and forth as um, Dr. Leroy suggested that there's business interests, they're going to pursue the business interest. So Facebook has played both sides of the fence for years, and it got worse in this past year. So they do seemingly good deeds and not so good deeds that are in, in pursuit of their business interests, and sometimes at the expense of health information and health misinformation. Muted, Ala. Yes. You're muted. I was asking, are there any more questions or comments? Feel free to share your experiences related to any of the, to anything that was mentioned in the panel. So I thought if I could throw out something. So to the panelists or to the audience. So if we think of things moving forward, how do we envision changes? Um, certainly Gandhi talked a lot about um, potential changes. So when, what are responsibilities in our community to see that we can um, somehow make a difference, a act in some responsible and constructive way to do our small part to reduce disinformation and health misinformation or its consumption? It's open to the panel as well. <laughs> uh, Gandhi, do you want to speak a little bit to that? Um, I'm on the algorithm side. I think um, so. If it if it can be done, but they they so they have a big problem also with they want to be fast and catch like YouTube videos that are maybe violence and all that. But they also have their customers 
And there has been pushback to that. Uh, I mean, there has been pushback that people say, why did you take down my video? So that's the other side. Like if they're fast, maybe they take down too much. I mean, we can, we can take all misinformation down, but we're gonna take down a lot of other information that we should be up to. So it's a, it's a balance that has to be found and that's not, that's not gonna get any easier. So I think that's something they are struggling with. Yes, and then the, ish, the question of the freedom of speech is being raised. And that's why when I'm thinking about, about this, again, being in this field, I think algorithms and machine learning work is very important, but we should remember that there are two sides of this. So we can work on the information side, trying to improve the information that is put out, but we can also try on the side of supporting the user the client, the consumer, helping people understand what kind of information is good information uh, and trying to lower susceptibility to this. And I see another comment. Uh, so self-regulated according to the news that they hear. Uh, I wish we could give a real auditory voice to our attendees. Could you please clarify a little bit? I think I understand the question, like who decides what is true, what is what is right, right? And I think a lot of that they look at um, trusted sources, like the CDC, for example, and just say, okay, what the CDC says today is what we're going to accept as fact. And then you don't have to decide whatever else you want to believe. You have a few that you can use to compare to. I think that's what the question was asking, like, you know, how do you know what, what you hear is right or wrong? Okay. And I see another comment in the chat from, from Sarah that said, Pacific Science Center in Seattle teamed up with the University of Washington Center for an informed public to create a virtual exhibit designed to help you navigate COVID-19 and the 24 hour news cycle. That's excellent. Thank you very much for putting this in the box. So, I mean, I could throw out another question if, if that is appropriate. So one of the things, so this isn't entirely true, but literacy tends to put an onus on cognitive issues, reasoning issues. Um, well, I, I think as we get into the, and that's very important, but as we noted in our study, the issues are broader than that. It, it's kind of trust and you can't necessarily change trust only by giving additional information or knowledge or changing the views. So particularly in the time of COVID, how do you embrace that larger picture? How do you think of things beyond cognition, beyond reasoning? How would you address that? And thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman. And while we're getting answers, I just want to read another comment from the chat box from Patricia Anderson. Um, one of the things I've been seeing as missing from the research around this is anything showing how many patients make negative decisions based on online misinformation and how many patients decide the information is questionable. Uh, Our study is a step in this direction, but trying to find other studies like this is extremely difficult as they get buried in all these studies on how many bad YouTube videos can I find in my topic? Thoughts? Let me just, I, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, and I think partly this is because it's very, very, very difficult to connect information and behavior. So much goes into a decision. We can all think about a time in our lives when we had to make a health-related decisions. You look, at you look at a lot of information, you talk to people, there are emotions, there are finances, whatnot. It's not easy at all to separate the impact of the information. And the other side of this is our kind of life's mission is provide high quality health information. Can we show that it really makes a difference? And we can show that it makes a difference as far as understanding, as far as health literacy, 
can we find tangible evidence and show that this actually improves health outcomes? It's very tricky. And I welcome the panelists and the participants thoughts on this. And we are actually at time. Um, so I just wanna thank our panelists for this wonderful discussion and presentation. And we are going to end the session to move to the, um, so attendees will have time to get to the next session. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, folks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.